Hello, 8th grade, and welcome to our screencast for the day. Today we're talking about measuring earthquakes. In last night's assignment, uh, you talked about more the stress of earthquakes, how earthquakes happen at different stress points along the Earth. Today's lesson really involves um, what happens, what comes from an earthquake, those earthquakes, those seismic waves that come from an earthquake. And that's going to be the focus of today's lesson. So on the screen right now, we've got a couple of objectives we're going to be going over. Uh, today we plan on describing how the energy of an earthquake travels through the Earth, we are going to identify the different kinds of seismic waves, and we're going to name the scales used to measure the strength of seismic waves, of these earthquakes. So, throughout this lecture today, what I hope you do, again, stop it if you need to, replay. If a part confuses you, by all means, take notes as you go through, and expect to have a little bit of a quiz uh, when you come back into class uh, on Monday after the weekend. So, here we go. So, when you measure earthquakes, we talk about a couple of key points of where earthquakes happen. And the first one is what's called the focus. The focus is the point beneath the Earth's surface where the rock that is under stress actually breaks. So this occur occurs along the fault line underground. Um, and the deeper the focus is, typically the less you're going to feel the earthquake. When it's near the surface, that's when you tend to get more damage because the earthquake is not traveling as far to get to the surface. But that focus is a point under the Earth where that rock actually slips past each other and breaks. Now, and typically on the news, when we talk about where earthquakes happen, they talk about the epicenter. And the epicenter is directly above the focus on the surface of the Earth. So a lot of times it's about the epicenter, is really the point on the surface of the Earth, directly above that, the point where the earthquake actually happened, where that rock actually broke or slid past each other. And that's usually in the news, you hear about that epicenter quite often. So, what happens when an earthquake strikes, when that rock actually slips past each other? What happens is, we get that kind of that motion, that quick motion, and so we'll get that rumbling feeling, rumbling sensation going through. I think we just had an earthquake. Did it happen? I'm not sure. So, what happens, what are created from earthquakes are seismic waves. And seismic waves are vibrations that travel through the earth carrying energy. Now, they carry energy away from the focus, through the Earth's interior and across all surfaces. So earthquakes can be detected you know, on the other side of the Earth. They can be held for, they can be felt for hundreds if not thousands of miles away uh, from that epicenter. And we'll focus more on that in the next few slides here about how can we tell how they travel through the Earth. We'll talk more about that. But the first thing here is that all seismic waves are not created alike. There are different types of seismic waves. They travel at different speeds with different amounts of energy. So let's look at some of these different types of seismic waves. There will be three major categories of seismic waves. We have P waves, we're going to call them primary waves. We have S waves, or secondary waves. And the final type, and the most destructive, are surface waves. So our first type here are primary P waves. They travel the fastest and cause the ground to compress and expand like an accordion. So think of a slinky, and that slinky if you were to pull just a couple springs back and let them go, they're kind of compressed and expand. Think of that accordion feel is what's going to happen. Our next type are S waves. And these are called secondary waves. And this is a seismic wave that moves the ground side to side and up and down. So they have more severe ground movements. And they, the one big thing about them is they cannot go through liquids. So they have some kind of look like a molten rock inside of the earth. That wave will stop. It will not be able to move through that type of material. And I have a quick video here to show you. I'm going to go back and click on this here. It's only a few seconds long, but you get to see kind of the movement of these P and S waves as they would travel through the earth. So the S wave is here on top. You get much more of that ripple effect. That up and down can also be a side to side effect. When we get to this P wave, I'm going to play it one more time. When we get that P wave, again, that's that accordion feel, that compressing and expanding of the ground as it moves through the earth. So again, these two types of waves are flowing through the earth after an earthquake. So we have our S waves. And finally, I'll come back to that slide, we have surface waves. Surface waves are P and S waves that have reached the surface. And I have a picture over here I'm going to show you right now, along here. Now, they move more slowly than P and S waves but they tend to produce the most severe ground movements. So you can see in this picture here, we have PNS waves traveling through, down through the crust, into the mantle. 
or that seismograph station, whatever was going to read that that earthquake. But there's also waves traveling along the surface of the Earth, kind of these combined PNS waves. And what they tend to do, they tend to ripple the ground. I always go back to in gym class when you bring out the parachute, and you play like the popcorn game, and you throw uh, the balls inside the parachute, and you flap it up and down. That's what the ground does if the uh, surface waves are severe enough. It just ripples the ground as they move through it. You can also see down here, we have a seismograph we'll talk more about in a few minutes. You can see these are minutes after where the earthquake happened as these travel through the earth. Here these P waves are going to be out in front. They're going to travel the fastest. A few minutes later, you get the S waves, see a little bit bigger. And finally, a few minutes later, again, causing the most damage, the most severe ground movements are these surface waves. You can see they're much more severe. So, how do we measure these different types of seismic waves? How do we measure how strong an earthquake is? There's a couple of devices we use, a couple of different methods that scientists use. Um, the first one is called a seismograph. And a seismograph, I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with a seismograph. What they tend to do, the old-fashioned ones, there's a giant spool of paper, and they have a needle kind of suspended. And if that ground were to move, that paper would move underneath it and record those ground movements from side to side. That's called a seismograph. And I've got a video here of a working seismograph we'll take a quick look at. And I'm going to jump ahead here. No, nothing really happening. About 20 seconds in. What you notice, you can see they kind of zoom in here. And right about now, you can see that the movements are very small. Right about there, you can see much larger side-to-side -side motion. That's indicating that there's an earthquake happening. See that, that big spike in the needle is indicating an earthquake is occurring in Iceland, which isn't that uncommon for Iceland. We're going to show a real quick uh, video of uh, a seismograph. All right. So our different scales, how do we measure seismic waves? We have three scales we're going to look at here real quick. We have what's called the Mercalli scale. Now, the Mercalli scale... It's an older scale, and what it does, it rates earthquakes according to their intensity or strength of ground motions. So what that means, you look locally at what happened, how severely the, the buildings were damaged around that area. So it's really more pertinent to that area of where things happen. Um, this can be good and bad because depending on what, what the ground is made out of, it's solid rock, it's more loose dirt, um, it can affect these different types of ground movements. So it's only so effective in getting an overall picture in the amount of energy released from an earthquake. Our next scale is the Richter scale. And this is probably the most commonly known scale. And this uses primarily as a way of determining how strong the earthquake was, those seismograph readings, which we just saw in the video before. So it's looking at those, how big those wave movements are, that side to side motion. There's also ones that measure the up and down movement also. And what they do is they rate those size, size of the waves and they kind of determine, they give it, put it to a scale and they measure it that way. Now, the final scale is the moment magnitude scale. And this is really the modern day thinking, the modern day way we look at earthquakes. It takes into account the size of the waves. Um, it takes into account how much damage is done. So again, those intensity of ground movements at a certain location. So it really takes into account all different things. And that's why probably the more modern day system of looking at how earthquakes are measured is that moment magnitude scale. In class, we'll also look at some differences here with the Richter scale and the moment magnitude scale. Um, it can be a little bit confusing because when you go up from one level to another, if you go from a 5 to a 6, it's not just uh, you know that much greater. The way they measure it's a little bit different. So we're talking more about that when we come back in a class on Monday. So I'm going to stop here, and I'll see you guys in class on Monday.